On this episode of Coding 101, collections! All sorts of them. Stop that. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code CODING. And by lynda.com. lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn. Instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on business, software, web development, graphic design, and more. For a free trial, visit lynda.com slash C101. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. Welcome to Coding 101. It's the Twitch show where we let you into the wonderful world of the Code Monkey. I'm Father Robert Vallow, sir. And I am Shannon Morris. And for the next 30 minutes, we're going to get you all learned it up on everything you need to know to be an awesome Code Warrior. Absolutely. Code Warriors are the place to be. <laughs> but before we get there, you know what I want? What do you want? I want some snubs compiled. Oh, do you now? I do. I'm just I'm hankering for the <laughs> Well, I guess it's a good thing I did some snuffs compiling All right, then. then. So I have a great viewer example from our Google Plus community today. So if you remember last week, we showed you a great example from Lou, our yeah, awesome code course. warrior. Yes, and yes. it was uh, XAML. Yes. It was super, super fun. So he, he basically asked us to do some changes and make the, the view model of it look a little bit different so you could add a background or do whatever you want. Well, Joe over in our Google Plus community posted not only a great description of how to get this working on your computer, but he also sent us a perfect example of his code. So let me go ahead and open this up. So just to let you know, he just sent over a couple of different files, just the main window, and that's pretty much all he changed. So what I did is I took Lou's copy and and I just copied and pasted it over into right, this page, right. and I just didn't change anything else. So if I go ahead and click on the project file, I'll open that. And anytime you want to open a project file from anybody else, just hit the CS project file down here, and it'll open up for you. Click OK. That's just warning you, don't open up any code from anybody you're not aware of. But you know what? It's our damn computer, so we're going to do it if we want <laughs> That's to. That's right. That's right, we are. So we have the regular code throughout here, and then down here is the main window. So this is what he changed. Now I'm going to go ahead and run it for you so you can actually see his changes compared to what Lou showed us last week. So he changed this up at the top a little bit. He made the lines a little bit more narrow so you can fit a lot more information down here. When I hit retrieve, he has everything centered over to the left side as opposed to just right. centered in the middle. the middle. And then when you click on one, You'll notice down at the bottom, you also have all these really cool options down oh, here. Oh, okay. So he so he's added the play controls. Buttons. Yeah, so I he included it. a stop, a play, and a pause. There's also a nice little scroll button here. This doesn't work, though, and he said, Joe said in the Google Plus community, if you can change this, you go right ahead, because right now it doesn't scroll anywhere. It just continues back to the top as, right. as normal. But all the other ones work just perfectly. You can play and pause, and you can stop, and that'll bring you right back to the beginning. Really, really That's cool nice. example, and I That's love nice. what he did with it. Oh, also, it could be, it's a perfect example of why we're building it this way. Oh, yeah. Uh, if, if we were just writing this as a structured program, so you know, get rid of all the object-oriented stuff and, and everything is one big chunk of code, yeah. changing the interface would require it would you to go really through hard. all the code and figure out where <laughs> things... Yeah, but with this, we know that because the view model is in the back, and the model is in the middle, yes. and that the view is in the front, all we have to do is change that first layer Yep. And voila, it looks like a completely different so program. So much easier. I so like yeah, it. I just wanted to show off his example this week. And of course, if you guys have examples or if you're kind of stuck on your own code, you can always join us over in the Google Plus community. It's bit.ly slash twitcoding101. That's fantastic. Well, but you know what? With all these codes, uh, that uh, all this, this software that's coming into us from our, our audience, mm -hmm. uh, Joe, thank you very much for, for sending us all the examples. That's great. I think that sometimes people need a place where maybe they could present their work, not just oh, on our absolutely. Google Plus group, but out to the, the real world of, of people who don't always code. I just wish there was a 
easy way to do that. I think I have a place for you, Padre. What's that? Squarespace. Oh, yes. Squarespace.com. It is the all-in-one place to get everything that you need to make an excellent website. Whether you need a portfolio or you need a business account or you just want to show off a wedding website like I did, mm -hmm. you can use Squarespace.com. So this episode, of course, is brought to you by Squarespace.com. They're the all-in-one platform. They make it easy to create your own business, professional website, or your online portfolio. They are constantly improving their platform. They have new features, new designs, even better support. And they have 25 beautiful templates for you to start out with and recently added a logo creator tool. This is pretty cool. It's a basic tool for individuals and small businesses with limited resources to create a really simple identity for themselves. So you can go in there and create your own logos. It's so cool and super great if you don't know Photoshop like me. <laughs> It's also very, very easy to use. It's incredibly easy to use, but if you do want some help, Squarespace is always available. They have a live chat, they have email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Plus there is a completely redesigned customer help site. So you get really easy access to help, self-help articles and tons of video workshops as well. And they have availability for e-commerce. So say you want to sell your stuff online, you can do that through Squarespace as well. They are now available for all subscription plan levels, including the ability to accept donations too, which is really great for nonprofits, or if you have a wedding website and you want to accept cash wedding registries or school fund drives. So pretty much anything that you want. Padre, you could use it. Yay! <laughs> and they're inexpensive. It just starts at eight dollars a month and they include a free domain name if you sign up for a year. That's what I did and I think it's the best choice. It's a really, really good price and it, well, it's excellent. And they're also mobile ready. I can't forget that. The new Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad allows you to check site stats like page views, unique visitors, social media follows. So you can really figure out where all of your viewership is coming from and you can fix it along the way too. So if you're getting more viewers from Twitter, you can always go over to Facebook and start to grow that business over there as well. And with the blog app, you can make text updates you can tap and drag images to change layouts, and you can monitor comments on the go. Even their code is gorgeous on the back, set, back end, so not just the templates, but their code too. So if you are a coder, you can really get down and dirty in there too. We all know that Squarespace looks beautiful on the outside, but what's also amazing is that all the code is beautiful too. Squarespace takes just as much pride in their back end code as they do in their front end design. And hosting is included. Yes, yes, that's right. Hosting is included, and that is one of the best parts. They take care of all the hosting, so you don't have to. Now, this is pretty cool. As a special promotion for our Coding 101 audience, everybody listen up. Squarespace is giving away a full year of its most premium level service. That's valued at more than 288 bucks to a randomly selected listener. All you have to do is tweet better websites for all with the hashtag Squarespace coding to be considered. And that again is better websites for all with hashtag Squarespace coding to be considered. And if you currently have a Squarespace site too, then post your site URL and we might talk about it in a future episode. Now start with a free two week trial with no credit card required and start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code coding, that's C-O-D-I-N-G, to get 10% off and to show your support of Coding 101. And of course, we thank Squarespace for their support of Coding 101. Because remember, a better web awaits and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Let's Do it. Yeah. Do it now. Do it. <laughs> All right, now let's go ahead and take a jaunt let's over have some fun. to the ivory tower. Yeah, it's fun time, right? Okay, yeah. Now we're going to talk about a little something, something that some people are going to feel like it's taking a step back, but it's it's actually taking a step forward in what we know about C sharp. We're going to talk about collections. 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 Yeah, I kind of remember collections from was it Python? Right, right. When we we were actually combining different data types yeah. and such. Uh, now there is actually in the chat room they they mentioned that some people were like, wait a minute, I thought collections were like housekeeping routines. <laughs> in early programming, you actually had to make sure that you had routines that would clean up oh, unused really? variables and procedures because you didn't want that to keep sucking away memory. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Right. Now uh, that's garbage collection. That's completely different. And uh, I'm not going to say it's it's completely solved in C-sharp. That C-sharp, it's automatic. It's not automatic, but it's mostly automatic. Okay. C-sharp does a really good job of doing all that house cleaning in the backup on its own, although you still do have to program correctly. <laughs> we course. are talking about a different kind of collection. 
Oh, what could yeah, that be? collections of objects, collections oh. of values, oh, right? I so see. when when we are programming in C Sharp or any object oriented programming, oftentimes we want to create a group mm -hmm. of different objects and values and methods and procedures. It's what we talked about with classes, right? That's right. the whole idea. Yeah, you create the blueprint for something that combines methods and variables, data and code at the same time which can then be instantiated into individual objects. So would you say a collection is kind of like a blueprint? It's a blueprint, but it's more than that, because you're specifically collecting certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas classes deal with code, mostly right. with code, when we start talking about collections, we, we're, it's mostly we're, we're collecting different data objects. Ah, okay? interesting. It's, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but also it's, it's important to, to sort of suss out in your mind when you're doing object-oriented programming mm -hmm. because we want to think of things as objects. Like, for example, this object is our data on sales prices. And ah, this yeah. object is our data on customers. And right. this object is our data on calendar. And we want to be able to tie together some of the objects that even though they may not be the same information, they're kind of they're close together, right? You want those in the same general area, so you make a collection. Oh, I see. So it's easier to find all that information because it's it's stored in this collection as opposed to being all over the place. Yeah. And it's it's really it's just again, this is the idea of of reinforcing an organized hierarchy. Organization is always organization good. Organization is good, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's key in object-oriented programming. Okay. Right? If you're not organized, it means that the next person who comes around has no idea what you've done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so when we start talking about collections, there are there, there's a there's a built-in uh, collection for us. It's an array. Oh. Arrays are actually I remember collection. arrays. I remember arrays, yeah. We yeah. talked about it for Perl. We talked about it for Python. We never actually got around it the first time we did C Sharp. Well, there's so much to talk about. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> and, and go ahead and go to my screen if you would. I'm showing you what a super basic program that deals with arrays looks like. So this is the console window, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you pull it up. And now I've got two different types of array declarations here. The first one, int then the little brackets uh -huh. and twit array. What that's doing is it's it's creating an array, but this is what's called a dynamic array. What so it's dynamic. It means it doesn't have a set length. Oh, okay. Uh, so now, you can make it keep on going forever? Well, yes and no. You, it's a really bad practice. You wouldn't want it to keep <laughs> on going forever. I mean, it would eventually suck up all the memory that you have oh, in your yeah. system. But uh, you know, in the old time, when, when I first started programming, it was very, very clear line delineated. Arrays are static. You set the size of your array, and your array will always be that size. Ah, okay. Uh, which mm -hmm. is actually, that's good programming etiquette. Because when you're, when you're programming and you're making an array, even if it's going to be a collection, you want to know how big it's going to be, how much it could possibly encompass, and you program for that value. Okay. What I can do here is I can go ahead and make it of an indeterminate size. So it's saying I'm going to have an array called twit array of integers, but I'm not specifying how big this thing is going to be. Uh, I, I don't like doing it that way, so I do it this way. This, does this look any, like any oh, familiar? Oh, yeah, it does. It's like when I'm declaring a class, right? So oh, it's like when case, I'm instantiating it. You're saying that this array called C101 array is going to have 10 different exactly. objects? So, I, yeah, this is now, this is a defined array. So it's going to have 10 cells, 10 elements that I can use. I'm making sure that it's an inter it's an array of, of integers that by doing this mm -hmm. called C101 array and then this looks just like when I instantiate a class. It's just like a class. It's yeah. just like a class <laughs> because this is actually an object. An array should be considered an object. And what's in the object? Inside the object is all the values that are contained within the elements of that array. So in this case, you have 10 different values, and the first one starts with zero. I remember that. Yes, too. yes, because remember, so let's say, I, I've just said I have an array that's 10 elements lo uh, long, right? Mm -hmm. But array start at zero. So if you'll notice, when I start assigning values to the elements of the array, I go from zero to nine, which comes out to 10. Right. right. So that's all this is. This is a super simple program, and if I run this, it just should count from one to ten on a new uh, a new lines, and that's what it does. Perfect. Counts from one to ten. Very very easy to use. Yeah. Very simple. But it 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 explains one very important thing, and that is that? what arrays do. Oh yeah. <laughs> so if, again, if we let me shut this down. If we look at the code, all an array is doing is it's saying, okay, make myself an array, mm -hmm. which means I'm going to have a single identifier. The identifier is going to be called. C101 array. 
And then in that array, I'm going to have 10 spaces, 10 elements, 10 cells, 10 mm -hmm. things. In this particular case, I've told it it's going to have 10 integers, so and 10 could numbers. could that be strings or floats or whatever well, I want it to Well, that's it. I could change it, right. Okay. So, so right here, I've declared them to be int. Yeah. So I'm telling it it's an integer. It's going to, integers are going here. This could also be string. Okay. This could be float. This could be bool. This could be double. All those things can be here. So I can make an array of pretty much anything. Cool. Yeah, and, and the nice thing is, it now allows me to collect data in one neat spot. Go yes, ahead and get away from my, uh, my window. Uh, you can drop that out of there. Uh, so when we start collecting data, uh, I could have something like Shannon guest list. Oh, could, yeah. And I could have an index that points to the different guests mm -hmm. in the guest list. Okay. And each one will be a string. So it's an array of strings, each with the name of that guest which means that each guest now can be searched by its index number. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Right? <coughs> so that's Excuse just me. that's the simplest of all collections. It's really easy to do. That's built in the C. I would tell people, go ahead and, and try it. Create an array and then use what we know about for loops. Yeah. Uh, like I, I used one, actually, if you, uh, go ahead and look in the code. Uh, there's just, just one quick example of the for loops. Uh, this, like, super simple. simple. I, I just did an uh, advanced encounter from zero to nine, because mm -hmm. it's le uh, less than 10, so it stops at nine. Uh, and each time it loops, it goes ahead and it increases the counter Plus by one. one. And then it just writes the, the, uh, the name of the array, so that's the identifier, and then the index is the counter. Okay. So it just increments from zero to nine. Uh, go ahead and see if you can write a function that fills the array, and then one function that prints the array. Oh, okay. Very, very easy to yeah. do, right? All right, now let's step a little bit away from arrays, because arrays are great, but arrays have one big limitation. Oh. Uh, actually, they have a couple of limitations, uh -oh. but the one that I always focus on is they're not great at storing objects of different type. Oh. So, like, yeah, for, that makes sense. So, for example, because if you had one int and one string, you can't put them in the same array, right? Because you've declared it, it would to get be confused. It would get well, it just wouldn't work. It, okay. Or you get some freaky, <laughs> freaky. Uh, like, for example, if you had an array of strings, and some of your strings you had numbers, and you tried to add the numbers together, C sharp would, but they're not numbers; they're <laughs> strings. What do you want me to do? Yeah, you can force it, sense. but it's you'd kind of have to hack around, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what you would do is you would have uh, this array has integers, this array has strings, this array has Boolean, whatever it's going to be, and then you would collect them together. Ah. Uh, so if you're going to be doing a lot of data, a lot of objects that have the same strongly typed data, mm -hmm. arrays are great. But if you want to collect data of, of disparate types of data, you're probably going to look at some of the other collections. Now, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of those other collections. I'm going to have to rewrite uh, my console real quick here. Um, this is probably going to mess up because I'm doing it live. There we go. So if you look, I've just changed one little thing here. I've added system collections generic. This is, oh. this is an include uh, that's not normally done in the console. C Sharp actually has, let me go ahead increase the size of that. C Sharp has a set of classes mm -hmm. that they have written and made available for you. It's just, you just add this line that deals specifically with collecting data, with making oh, these collections. Cool. Uh, go ahead and come back from And this that. is just one of the many. I'm assuming there's tons of them. Oh, there's many, right. So, so like, uh, actually one of them is just using system collections, and then there's system collections generic. Uh, and, and, you know, C Sharp is C Sharp. So as you mm -hmm. start saying using system.collections, it will tell you all the different ones you can use. And, and I believe we linked to the site where uh, Microsoft lists all the different ones yes. you can use as well. Right, right, right. And, and again, this, this is part of the fun of object-oriented programming. This is just what Joe did at the beginning of the show, right. which is, why do I have to rewrite it? If someone's already written a class that does this, I'm just going to deal with just the Just grab output. the class. <laughs> I'm just going to grab the class. Right, so .NET, the .NET framework, includes, base, built into its code base, a bunch of classes that do collections. And there's a couple of different collections that we use. We use arrays, mm -hmm. of course, but we're also going to use what are called lists. Oh. Now, lists are like arrays. They're treated the same. They, they look slightly it different. It sounds like an array. It sounds like an array, because it's a list of stuff. An array is an array of stuff. I'm guessing with lists, you can use different types of values? Well, lists mainly vary from arrays in that they were designed from the beginning to be dynamic. They were designed ah. to grow and shrink as you needed them to. Okay. Whereas arrays, you can make them dynamic, but 
That's not how they were designed. Right. There's workarounds to make it dynamic. So when we're dealing with a list, we're talking about like an automatically, dynamically resized list of things, of objects. It means that we don't have to define at the beginning how big the data set is going to be. It would just grow or shrink to fit the data set that's currently in there. Okay, that's uh, cool. Right, which is, which is nice. So, uh, and the, the, the syntax is a little bit different. I don't want to go through it because it looks pretty much the same as going with arrays. Oh, okay. But there's two others that are in the basic collections. The first one's called a dictionary, and the second <laughs> one is called a hash. Oh, I've heard of hashes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, that's hash brown. That's no, 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 I know. No. Password hashes. And, and actually, actually, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So it, there are different ways of collecting different types of data. When I talk about a dictionary, it's just like it's a dictionary. It allows me to store values and then search for them based on the keywords attached to those values. Oh, okay. Right? That makes sense. And then when I store hashes, it allows me to store values and search for them by the by the value? By the hashes. Or the hash, yeah. yeah. It's, so it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. That's cool. Uh, going back to my screen, I'm going to show you what a basic uh, hash looks like. So uh, this, again, super simple. This is, uh, actually, this is using a dictionary. So I've got a, uh, a several things stored in here for dictionary. Oh, wait, I totally saved the wrong one. Uh, this one's actually broken. I didn't fix it. Uh, that's OK, because this, this actually still does, sh still does show the syntax. Okay. Uh, You'll notice that the code for this looks a lot like the code I did for an index, right? So yeah, it I, does. I go ahead and I, I uh, instantiate the object, the dictionary. Um, I, I declare it, and then I start filling it. And instead of filling it just with numbers like I did with the array of integers, in this particular case, I'm filling it with a keyword and then a value. And I can search for it via that keyword. Oh. Right? And that's go ahead and cool. come back, Ryan. So when we start talking about collections, what we're really talking about is we're talking about how do you make the data that's available to your program searchable, mm -hmm. organizable, and usable by the further parts of the program. So once I get all like that. Sounds like I would want to use lists. You want to use, well, I mean, see, <laughs> don't, uh, actually, here's, here's the problem. Programmers tend to get caught up with the stuff they do best. Yeah. So if you learn arrays, by golly, you're going to make everything look like an array. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and if you learn lists better than anything else, everything becomes a list. You really want to go with the, the – because there's subtle There's differences. a best use case scenario There is best use one. scenarios, right. Like, for example, can I search for the keyword of a, of a, a bunch of stuff in an array? Yes, I can. It's kind of a, a kludge. I have to go ahead and, and write something that's going to read each element of the array uh, and then yeah. – compare it and then say, okay, I want this one or I go to the next one. Or I could use a dictionary. And a dictionary is set up to do keyword rating. So uh, a dictionary would be the best option for that. For that particular one, right. And there's always a use case for which collection you want to use for any particular program that you're writing. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can get on board with that. Okay. <laughs> so that's all the theory. But what we have to do is we have to bring in our code warrior. And what our code warrior is going to do is show you the code that goes behind taking this idea of collections and uh, actually turns it into something useful. Uh, so but, uh, you want to. But before, yeah. before we go, like, how, where, is there another place I can go somewhere where I can learn more you know, about this? I am glad you mentioned that because, as we both know, Coding 101, it's just the surface. In fact, we were talking about yeah, this it is. right before, <laughs> right? You were saying how uh, you had received uh, uh, an email from people who were saying, well, why didn't you do it this way? Why right, didn't you do it yeah. that way? And it's like, well, we know. There's so many different ways you can go with coding. All we're trying to do is get people interested so that they can seek out the knowledge on their own. But there has to be a place where they can seek out that knowledge. Where's that place, Padre? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a place <laughs> called lynda.com. Oh. That's right. lynda.com is your one-stop shop, your repository for knowledge on the Internet. Do you want to learn new business skills? Do you want to learn how to communicate? Do you want to learn how to program? Do you want to learn how to edit video or photos or put together your latest quadcopter project? Well, lynda.com has it all. That's what makes them the repository for information on the Internet. They're an easy and affordable way to help you learn. You can instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on software, web development, graphic design, and more. Lynda.com works directly with industry experts and software companies to provide timely training, often on the same day that new versions of those software packages are released, which means if you want to stay current in your skill set, Lynda.com is the perfect companion. All courses are produced at the highest quality. These aren't like those homemade videos on YouTube, which again, I love. That's, that's where I come from. I started making homemade videos. But sometimes when you want to learn, 
You don't want to be distracted by scratchy audio or just lighting that's piss poor. You want to go someplace where the production values actually add to the learning, not detract. Now, tools include searchable transcripts so that you can find specific problem-solving portions of the videos, which is great because sometimes you just need a reference, and lynda.com lets you do that. They also allow you to use their software, whether you're a beginner, advanced, or experienced. I mean, that's the nice thing about lynda.com. You choose where you are and what you have to learn, and lynda.com will find it for you. You can also watch while you're on the go with lynda.com apps for iPhone, iPad, and Android. And they have one low monthly price of $25, which gives you unlimited access to over 100,000 video tutorials. Our premium members with an annual plan can download courses for the, uh, their iPhones, their iPads, or Android devices and watch them off offline. This is the perfect way to use Lynda as a repository of data because sometimes you, you're not connected to the internet, but you need the answer. That's where lynda.com comes into play. Now, lynda.com also has courses on up and running with CentOS Linux, practical cybersecurity, Amazon Web Services, essential training, and up and running with Symfony 2 for PHP. In other words, they're always adding those topics, those subjects that are hot. You want to learn about cybersecurity? It's there. You want to learn about Symfony 2? It's there. Do you want to be up and running with CentOS? It's there. For any software that you rely on, Lynda.com helps you stay current with their updates and learn the ins and outs to be more efficient and productive. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Lynda.com free for seven days. Visit Lynda.com slash C101 to try Lynda.com free. That's Lynda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. And we thank Lynda for their support of Coding 101. I think we've... Uh, like, what is that? Run around the tree? Uh, <laughs> I think we're ready. I think we're ready. I think we're ready for the Code Warrior. We are ready for the Code Warrior. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, our master of all things code, it's Lou Maresca, senior software hey developer at Microsoft. It's so good to see you, Lou. Good to see you guys, too. Now, tell me. We, uh, we've been messing around with collections a little bit. It's one of these things that I think... Uh, it, it's almost like learning object-oriented programming the first time. It, it, <laughs> as, as, it seems a little bit more easy. It seems easy, but like, like most people are like Shannon, who are going to say, well, why am I going to use a dictionary? Dictionary yep. sounds stupid. I'm just going to use an array of words. Show me. Show, Show me why I want us. to use one or the other. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think one of the important things is the, you know, C Sharp or any of these languages, they give you data structures like arrays and stuff so that you can do things easily. And I think Padre showed arrays or list. And list is actually a little bit more complex of a type because it's it's what we call a generic type in C sharp, and we haven't really got into generics. I think in C they call it templating, and then I think in even Java they call it generics too. But it's a little bit more complex. So one of the ones I wanted to kind of talk about is an array list. You guys talked uh, ever seen a array list before? It's basically what an array is, but it, it's dynamic and it lets you kind of expand that as you want to add Ooh. things. And so. Yeah, just as you showed in your code, I can kind of show in my code real quick. Um, so this is the social network app that we built um, the, a couple episodes ago. And what I did was instead I added an extra um, little spot here where we can display everyone's tweets. Um, so, you know, basically the tweets from my home page, from my home, home stream. And so what I did was I bound that to a button click when I clicked the refresh button. Um, it goes and, and gets the tweets. And it's going to get the tweets from my special Twitter class that I created. I created another method in here called Quarry Home Tweets. And so this is, again, just using the link to the Twitter library to get the tweets. But really what we want to look at down here is what I'm returning. So this is just a new, let me zoom in so you guys can see a little easier. This is just a new array list. And what an array list is, is again, I'm saying give me everything that I got returned, the results of those tweets, and just stick it inside that array list. An array list lets me store pretty much any type. It's it's kind of a strange uh, uh, data type because it lets me store pretty much any type. So it could be int or an object or, a, in this case, a status from a tweet. And so sometimes uh, people say, well, do you really want to use that? Because that can cause the memory to kind of grow and, and dynamically you don't really know how big it's going to be at any point in time. The nice thing about an array is you say I have 30 uh, elements in that or 
items in that array and I know it's going to be an integer and so that I know exactly the pro the actual runtime knows exactly how large that's ever going to be. Right. Uh, Lou, so that's, that, that, that's actually one of the, the things that I think a lot of programmers who have been doing this for a while will remember, which is we used arrays because they used a fixed amount of memory. Mm -hmm. no, matter, no matter what you put in it, you declared that memory at the very beginning so it took its chunk and it could never grow. It always confuses people when we move from that to a dynamic way of thinking about allocation of memory, allocation of resources. Right. But that's that's what we, we can do with lists, right? That's right. Exactly. And so people don't like, again, some people don't like using lists because they they don't, you never really know how big it can be because you can store anything you want in there at any point in time. Right. So there is another type um, and that's called, again, you were just talking about it, it's called a generic list. And generics are, again, a little bit more complex of a concept, but basically what that is, is if I say, hey, I want a list, then I have these little special carrots that I can put in here and I can say, well, I definitely want the type to be a string. So I, I can put a, whatever I want in a string and, I could, and I'm going to new that up. And now I got this dynamic list of strings only. And so now the list, and it has a default size underneath the covers. You can actually specify your own size too, just like an array. So if I wanted the size of 20. Now it's a default list of strings at the size 20. So no, so oh. the, the runtime knows exactly the size that it needs to be when it runs. Right. And then when I start adding things, it will again dynamically grow. Well, but again, well you know, is, we've got a question from the chat room. Well, sure. isn't, there, isn't there a danger of overflow when we start playing with dynamic elements? I mean, if you've got a list that could expand forever filled with who knows what, that could be a security hole, right? So what do we do to make sure that doesn't happen? So anytime you put something into a list, you got to make sure that, I mean, the thing that the underlying data structure handles that itself. So like sometimes it'll say, you know, I have a maxim, I can't add anymore, I run out of memory. Um, there are exceptions that get thrown when you, you hit that point. But also you want to check what you're adding too. So like, for instance, in my case, I'm, I got a, back, a bunch of whole tweets back, a big large list of tweets, and I'm just shoving it into the right. I probably should s specify, you know, how many are in there, maybe the count. And then I can go add them. Uh, so I'm basically sanitizing before I actually add to that list. It makes me think of uh, there was a bug that was discovered in Android not too long ago where the comment that, pe that people were able to read in the code was, I made this variable X length because I'm pretty sure it will never need more space than that. <laughs> Which if I'm, a, if I'm a hacker, I'm reading that going, oh, okay, so I make it one byte longer and I'm overflowing. That's nice, Dude. that's awesome. But I mean, that, yeah, you're right. The tool, so the, the compiler, the language actually does a really good job of making sure that doesn't happen. But just because you're using a dynamically generated object, that doesn't mean that you can completely do away with thinking about how much memory a particular process or object's gonna take. Right. Yeah. So there, there's an even more fundamental data structure that like some programmers use an underlying uh, data structure. They call it a link list. And a lot of people in the chat room are talking about it. And a lot of these data structures that C Sharp uses are basically a link list under the covers. And really all a link list is, is it just a node that connects to each other. And, and then you can kind of iterate through each node as you go along and connect them even more and more and more items as time goes on. And so again, a list is just a, a dynamic version of that where you can add like an integer or a string and you can keep adding, adding, adding. And it allows you to not only go to an item that you want using an index, kind of like an array, but also you can kind of iterate or list, go through each one. Right, right. Oh, so uh, actually, Lou, here's, here's another question that people are going to ask. Uh, and again, I, I know arrays really well, so I want to stick with arrays. Why can't I just make an array that contains other arrays, one that has my integers, one that has my strings, one that has my, my Boolean uh, values. Well, you know, why wouldn't I just do it that way? Why would I have to use a list in order to, to, to get all the, uh, the um, benefits of collections? You could, I mean, that's a, one way of doing it. I think the, the whole key to list is, is doing a lot of that work for you. Like if you wanted to, let's say you want to have an array that was also dynamic, you would also then, every time you wanted to add an item to that array, you'd have to go create a new array that was bigger yeah, load and then copy everything from the first one and, and shove it into the second one. That so that's annoying. A, it's annoying yeah. and uh, it always leads to errors because there's always yeah. problems. In fact, yeah, well, like when I was programming in Visual Basic, that was the number one cause of, of errors. When people tried to copy something from one array to another, something always got screwed up. Every single time. Right. Every <laughs> single time. Yeah, yeah, it's better if it's the array can just grow. Yeah. So another thing too is there's a lot of other data structures that we, we can go in probably for a long time. The collections library itself has like, I don't know, like a hundred different type of collection types. 
But there's some really unique ones. Like, for instance, I think another one that we should probably talk about is there's one called a hash set. And a hash set, basically, just like in cryptography, a hash is just like a generated version or string version of some t something, uh, kind of like a, it, it's like a string version of an object, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's unique sometimes, most of the time. And so that hash um, could be put into a collection. So if I wanted to shove a string into a collection, let's say a bunch of usernames, and I never wanted to have duplicates, I could use a hash set because then that, that guarantees that that hash is unique for every user ID. And I can store a whole bunch of large set of users, user IDs in that hash set, and there'll never be a, uh, a duplicate one. Wow. So that's, that's another collection. That sounds very familiar to some some of the things I've learned yeah. from security. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. See, oh, wow. Th that they might go hand in hand. That's so strange. Gee, I wonder why. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now we we've talked a little bit about it. We yep. need to see it in in action. Sure. You, you've actually got an example that could show us how you're doing collections. Yep. So one of the ones here, like I said, I I basically wrote a query to allow me to get a list of uh, tweets from any specific user. And then what that does is that the, the actual link to Twitter API will return uh, the minimum of 20 at that time. And that returns it as a list. In this case, I'm just converting it to an array list to kind of show you what an array list can do. And basically, it's just newing up an array list. It's adding the result in there. And then over on my, uh, over on my window here, I'm actually going to do a for loop. Uh, through every one of those tweets in that array list. And so there's two ways to do it. I, we, I don't think we've ever gone over a for each loop, but this is, there's while loops and for each loops, but this is a for loop. And so I just basically say, well, in that array list, how many are there? And I'm going to start from zero and just go up to that amount. And, and then for every one of them. by one each time, right? Right. That's right. Increment by one each, one, each time. That's the, what this little X plus plus guy here is. And then every time I, f I hit one, I'm going to go add it to my collection of, uh, or my, my observable collection, again, another uh, type of collection uh, that C Sharp offers. And that will basically uh, notify my UI that I have a new tweet. And then it'll basically break out and list those tweets. I so get that's it. one way. Yep. I just so got very excited because uh, I understood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, the observable, while, while I log in really quick here, observable collections are basically a collection that every time you add an item to it, it will, oops, I guess I should probably type that right. Um, it will always add a, um, it will always notify the UI about what's happening. So this way your UI can go and update, update itself. So I enter the little pin. Okay, so now I have the UI here. And if I click down at the bottom to actually refresh, you notice now I get all the tweets from my home screen here. So oh, again, cool. it just immediately updated. Pretty quick. And you so, loaded all of that into a list on uh, on in in memory. That's right, in memory. So this is all in memory right now. And these are all the people that I follow. Ellen DeGeneres is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Um, well, yeah. Uh, and, exactly. Um, so but there are, again, there are other, other ways to do this. Um, there's a, a thousand and one ways to do this. Um, you, like I said, I could, could have created a generic list. Um, another example is what we call a dictionary. So right. like if I wanted to say, I, I just want to be able to get a user's tweet by their user ID. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, I can create a generic uh, dictionary here that's basically allows me to rip through each one of those and add them based off the username. And now what I can do is I can say like if, if, Padre was in this, I could say user ID and I can say Padre SJ. Yep. And I could basically get the tweet for Padre SJ. It would just return the tweet for that. So that's yeah. a unique diction or a dictionary. It allows me to kind of look things up based off key values. Yeah. So yeah. it's basically so, going to be searching for Padre SJ in each of the strings. That's right. And the cool okay. thing about uh, a dictionary is again, it's a it's a data structure that's compiled of uh, basically a hash underneath the covers because it's the key is basically a unique value. So like Padre is a unique user ID that nobody else has on Twitter. And I know that I can add that to the dictionary that a hash value. And that could be the key. And then the value is the actual tweet. And so then I can go and really quickly find Padre and his tweet uh, using this dictionary. Right. But those are linked together. So if, right. you look, if you find the key, you're going to find the string that's attached to the key. OK, that makes sense. Right. So there's a lot of, again, a lot of different cool collections that you can use. And this code is, is neat because you can basically 
you know, you can use a dictionary for, let's say you wanted to have a little box for a user that just displays Padre's tweets, or if you just displays my tweets or something, you could add that to your UI and then you combine it to something like this that says, hey, go give me all the tweets that uh, Padre has kind of thing. If you haven't already, please, 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 please get your UI, the API code from Twitter so that you can play with this. Because this is a, this is actually a fantastic piece of code. And look how small it is. Uh, yep. Because, again, he's just, he's using a class that's doing all the work and the grunt work in the background. But you can scrape off your favorite tweets. You could scrape off the mm -hmm. favorite parts of Twitter. You, and, and you can get similar keys and APIs for Facebook and for Google+, Plus, which means if once you know how to store things into a list or into a dictionary or into whatever collection that makes the most sense, you now have a collection of usable data. You know, something that actually makes sense to you, something that you can use. Right. That's yep. cool. It's nice. So the and, recommended approach is always use uh, kind of generics because, again, like you said, it allows you to specify what you're putting in there, the string, and, of course, the, the size. And it also allows you to dynamically uh, grow that thing over time. So that's the kind of the new, the 2.0 way of doing C Sharp. The array list is kind of the 1.0 way of doing things. So that's the recommended approach. So dictionaries and half sets and lit lists and observable collections, these are all different types of generic collections that yeah. C Sharp offers. Yeah. And it's just, it's just, it's good programming because if you know that your data set is indeterminate, an array is a really bad place to store it mm -hmm. because you have no idea whether or not you're going to overflow that array. Right. Either you're going to be wasting a lot of space or you're going to reach that point where hopefully your, your error handling will say, I can't fit anymore, or <laughs> you get an overflow situation. So if you use one of these collections, these generic collections mm -hmm. that are designed for this, it's just going to work a lot better. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Lou, of I love course, that this is another one of those things that people have already wrote the code for. Yeah. <laughs> well, we like that, right? Yeah. I mean, that always that always makes us feel makes better. It's easier for me. Lou, we're going to make these examples available for all of our users. And again, thank you very much. But before we end, you wanted a little bit of time to talk about something that's, um, well, Xamarin-ish. Is that's that even right. a word anymore? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's a great, really cool company called Xamarin, um, and they offer this, this new studio uh, that allows you to download. It, can work, it works on Mac, and it works on, uh, you know, in on, I think it, they're trying to get it on Linux too, but it works on Windows and Mac for right now, OS X, uh, and allows you to basically build um, a mobile app using C Sharp and then the UI components of Android and iOS and Windows, uh, and and basically build that app once and then compile it thereafter. And so the kind of the cool thing is, it's an extension on top of each Visual Studio. You can do it in Visual Studio, or you can go and use their Studio itself. Right. And you can basically build a project just like we've been building with the social app. In fact, the social app that I'm going to give you can be converted to a Xamarin uh, a project because it uses what they call portable class libraries, meaning it uses only libraries that Xamarin offers. And then uh, you can basically move it across platforms. It's kind of cool stuff. So one of the things they want to check out is go to Xamarin.com, download the studio, load up this social uh, project, you can actually load up the C Sharp project in there, and then you can try to compile it in there. It'll use just the Visual Studio compiler, and then it'll ask you what you want to do with it. Do you want to create an Android version of this? Great, that's yeah, perfect web page. So you can create an Android version of it. You can create an iOS version of it. Now, in order to edit the iOS version, you can actually do it within the Studio, but then you actually have to load Xamarin Studio up inside of OS X in order to compile it and everything. But again, it's it's a very unique kind of cool way of of getting into the other platforms quickly. And I was going to show you a demo, but unfortunately, my Xamarin Studio um, license it was up, and so I couldn't <laughs> get it to work. Uh, but you can get a shared version. I just I think it's a 30-day trial, or I think the free version allows you to use it indefinitely. But if you want to compile it on other platforms, you got to go and uh, purchase it. But the really cool thing is, just for testing, they allow you, you allow you to use it. So we have a full license here, though. Well, if anyone from Xamarin is listening, uh, hey, Lou wants to show off your software. Help, <laughs> hook, hook a brother up. Hook, hook a code warrior up. That's a new yep. thing. Yeah. So I do know that the project I'll give you, though, if you do load it up in there, it's really fast. It'll just You just load it up, and boom, the UI. It'll immediately tell you, oh, yeah, this is portable. Well, the UI is already provided with you with the XAML file that I gave you, and then we can go and compile it, and it'll run as a Windows Phone app and then as an Android app, too. Cool. Fantastic. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Lou Maresca, our code warrior. He's the guy that we go to with questions about C Sharp, senior software developer, developer over at Microsoft, and just an all-around good guy. Lou, thanks again for being on the show. It's always I love having you on any Twitch show. Can you tell the it's folks at home where they can find you? They, they want to find yeah. you. They want to find your work. The Twitter.com, Lou M. Uh, and about me, that Lou M. M. And of course, all as always, CRM.dynamics.com is where all my work is at. Fantastic. We will see you next time, sir. And until then, we salute you. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, it's that's a terrible salute. That's, I know. It, it's, you have to like, snap it, right? It's, it's, yeah, like, and it has to be in the right You place actually know how to do it. I mean, you're, you've got military <laughs> training. I'm, I'm just like seeing it from the cartoons. Uh, in any case, I, we know that this was a lot of information. Everything but from it's the, good information, uh, and it's not not oh, as yeah. hard. I don't no. think. No, no, this this was nice and easy. We're trying to we're trying to make sure that you can actually get the the lessons. If you want to find any of the information that we gave you, if you want to find the show notes, you have to go to our show page. Just make sure that you go to uh, what is it, Shannon? www.twit.tv slash code code. Just go to Twit TV code. And you'll be able to get not only all of our show notes, but also all of our episodes. I'm not sure what I'm doing there. <laughs> all of our episodes in one single place. It's it's because because we love you. Also, you can find us on iTunes. If you are an iTunes user, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. Make sure that you get it each and every single week. Because That's if you miss right. a week, it gets kind of hard to catch up. But if you're more of a Google fan girl or fanboy like I am, you can always go over to youtube.com slash twitcoding101 and subscribe over there. Please do. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah. And you can also join our Google Plus community. Again, that's bit.ly slash twitcoding101. And that's where you can ask ask and answer all the questions. All of the questions. All, all the things. Really good ones, too. Yes. Well, the nice thing about that community is that it's filled with people at different levels of, yes, of programming absolutely. knowledge. We've got and brand nobody's going to make fun of you if you ask a no. question that you think is stupid, because no question is stupid. I mean, we may make fun of you, but it will be in a funny way. Oh, stop. Okay. He no, won't. no, we won't, won't make fun of you. <laughs> also, if you don't like Google+, Plus, you can always join us on the Twitters. Now, uh, you can find me at PadreSJ. That's twitter.com slash at PadreSJ. Slash and at. Uh, slash. I'm a slash at. Slash. I'm what? snubs. I mean, oh. I'm snubs on Twitter. That's it. Twitter fail. <laughs> I just, I just Twitter failed. Uh, don't forget that we do this show live every Thursday at 1:30 p.m. Pacific time. You can find us live at live.twit.tv. If you watch, you can see the pre-show, all the foibles, the mess-ups during the show, <laughs> and the post-show. It's actually kind of fun. You know, it is. when when Leo built this this enterprise that we call Twit, he had this idea of making it sort of the, the, the look at how the donuts are made. And you can definitely see our donuts. <laughs> Maybe yours. <laughs> and you can also join us in the chat room. It's irc.twit.tv. And we take questions from you guys during the show. So if you guys have any questions like, does your Coca-Cola say Shannon? No, it does not, Janice Koo. But thank you for asking. <laughs> you can mate. join us over there. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. I'm Shannon Morse. And the line. line.